Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm pleased to see you here because today we're going to have a difficult but at the same time very interesting topic. And since we are having this talk in the evening, I'm glad that you came because I don't know what you've been thinking to listen an hour and a half for an academic to talk about machines. Well, it's a bit weird, I guess. But still, thank you for visiting us. Uh, basically, what I want to say is that today we're going to be discussing machines. And specifically, I'm talking about two types of machines. Computers and people, or human, as you would like to say. Now, um, since we're talking about uh, conscious machines in different ways, I have a quick question, let's say, a quick quiz. What comes to your mind when you hear artificial intelligence? What is the first thought that crosses your mind? Any ideas? Come on, don't be shy. What do you think when you hear AI? First, that crosses your mind. Robots, okay, what else? Neural yeah. models. Huh? Neural models. Neural models, okay. Anything else? Simulation of consciousness. Simulation of consciousness, very good. Uh, the audience is definitely more prepared than I would rather expect. Uh, well, actually, the point that I want to stress is that traditionally, when we hear a lot about AI, when we read all the stuff on the internet, different press, you know, traditionally we kind of hear one and the same thing. Is there a threat in artificial intelligence? Is it possible that when machine becomes consciousness and self-aware, is it possible that it will somehow dominate us? At least this is what we have been told uh, time and time again in different science fiction novels or movies. I mean, come on, doesn't Terminator crosses your mind when you hear artificial intelligence or so? Well, um, different scientists try to warn us of the possibilities and at the same time of the threats that it can possess. For instance, Nick Bostrom from University of Oxford here has been given a talk uh, that kind of uh, been predicting the possibilities, the negative possibilities of artificial intelligence or machines that become consciousness, what can happen. And basically from the very TED talk that I made this picture of him here on the slide, uh, at the very end of this TED talk he mentions that while it is a huge challenge on its own to create a conscious machine, there is another layer of challenge on the top of this one, which is making it safe. And basically, while this is a possible uh, I don't know, nuclear weapon that we are designing right now, we still have a grant in our hands to design it. So it's up to us to decide how we create these machines. Uh, now a good question. Who of you here in the room have or saw it at a certain point of your life, movie 2001 Space Ed, Odyssey? Raise your hand. Okay, great. Who have never seen this movie? Okay, great. I was expecting that there might be some, some sort of a third group who didn't understand the question or wasn't paying attention. But that's good that we have counted. So, uh, for those of you who have seen, you probably know this little fella on the right. Uh, for those who don't, well, you're probably going to hear some spoilers right now. Well, it's a lecture, not a movie theater, right? Uh, so basically, this is HAL 9000, the artificial intelligence who was driving the space station. And at a certain point in the movie, you know what happened. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, try to think. Do you think that HAL was inherently evil? artificial intelligence. What do you think about it? Any ideas? I mean, at least it is supposed to be evil, right? But think about it. Uh, he was on a mission and uh, he was programmed to kind of achieve this mission. And by the way, while programmed to achieve this mission, he was never told, don't kill everybody on the space station, right? So technically, he was following a program. He was doing a great job by killing the space crew and achieving his mission. So, uh, while maybe somehow we're trying to see this like inherently evil AI that is taking over the station, actually this is a pretty clever program that follows the rules and try to calculate the best possible way to achieve any type of uh, result that is programmed to do so. So, what is it actually that makes people fear artificial intelligence so much? I mean, this is not like, you know, general population fear who do not understand what AI is. A lot of scientists talk about it. I mean, Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, a lot of people uh, from the Institute of Life uh, are talking you know, about it uh, a lot, like what are the possible threats. And while at the same time we are feeling that conscious machines are the next step of evolution, at the same time we fear that they might be our demise. Is this the fear of taking over? Well, probably on one hand, yes, because I mean, 
the image of Terminator is kind of imprinted in our minds and we kind of have seen it a lot in different types of fiction. But apart from fiction, there is a lot going on there. So it's not just, you know, like uh, a primitive fear of not understanding things. Because basically fear is what it is. When you do not understand what it is, you fear that it might somehow hurt you, that it might change your life. And obviously uh, we had a lot of examples of happening with, with, with different types of discoveries in the world, with different types of like nuclear weapons, for instance. Like we didn't know where it might lead, and well, now we know. We still do not know how far can artificial intelligence, when it reached the point of super intelligence, can go. And I mean, we probably heard this story, this myth, all along, like uh, when machine kind of becomes aware of itself and understands that this is a slave for human, it probably would want to enslave us, right? But on the other hand, there is a pretty understandable fear that's going on, right? If you Google or, and by the way, search in the internet for whatever browser you would like to, I wouldn't promote anything, uh, you would probably find a lot of various statistics of how um, artificial intelligence, how different robots and automation is taking our jobs. This is very real fear, right? Like, I mean, at a certain point we're talking sci-fi, like, I know, extermination of human race. And on the other hand, we see a lot of charts and statistics that saying that a lot of jobs are being, like, replaced by machines and probably replaced forever, right? So, I mean, there are different statistics. They say they provide different types of data, but still, it is a very real and reasonable thing going on. On the other hand, should we fear that? Probably not, that we might treat it as a next industrial revolution. This is definitely where it has been going for a long time. And while a lot of press has been discussing it for a long time, right now this is something that is happening. Should we fear it? My guess is not, because we need to think of rather how to cooperate with it than to kind of, you know, work with our old jobs. Because, uh, you know, the market changes, the labor market changes, and, you know, we need to be aware of this situation. On the other hand, this is not the only thing while we actually fear the possibilities of artificial intelligence. Christian Hammond here from Northwestern University uh, actually produces a very well-designed thought. He says that we are terrified because uh, when we kind of can program something that is like us, then maybe we are ourselves programmed or programmable. And I mean, from, since the dawn of time, human has been treating himself as like a godlike creature. Creationism has been following us all along, and we've been like told this myth that we probably have been created by something else in this life, or somebody else, some superior being. On the other hand, human himself, a man, is creating a lot of things, so we are creationists in our nature. At the same time, when we create something that advanced, like a machine, human-like machine with a consciousness, does that mean that we ourselves might have been once programmed or that we are programmable? And this is why we struggle to find what is it so unique and human about us, human. And this answer probably lies somewhere in a different lecture. But still, uh, when we think of it from perspective that we might have been not the, uh, like, the only uh, demiurge of this creation, and what if we have been created by somebody or programmed? This is basically what what comes to real life right now. Because, for instance, if you if you think Elon Musk, who is kind of always you know talking a lot about like threats and possibilities of AI, uh, he believes that the next step of evolution is trying to merge human with machine, like the Neuralink project and the other ones. Like the open AI is kind of exploring this things as well. The general idea here is that maybe our salvation is not just cooperating with machines, but even merging with machines. This is like a completely different topic, yet one of the possible scenarios that we might go in if we develop the consciousness in machines. Now, why is it happens? Why is it that we always imagine um, consciousness machines as like human-like beings? Uh, we have actually a very interesting um, theory uh, in 1877 by Ernst Kapp, uh, he formulated his so-called philosophy of technology. Basically the principle that he called organ projection means that when a person, a human, creates something, we usually tend to think of some organs that we have that kind of our creations are extensions of ourselves. And while he has been talking about weapons and tools, 
we kind of can think about anthropomorphic robots. Because when we think robots, we always try to think something that looks like human. And it was so in like, science fiction, obviously, a lot. Um, it is only natural that if you like look at your smartphone in your pocket, you have a camera there, which is kind of a projection of an eye that you can look through. We have the senses just like machines. I mean, we are organisms, yet at the same time we are machines, and we design machines that look like organisms. So this is like happens naturally due to the philosophy of technology. But then there is a very interesting research that happened one day, uh, and uh, the Japanese um, roboticist Masahiro Mori has created this a social experiment. And basically, you know that Japan is known for creation of human-like robots like from Honda and different other corporations. I think there was some sort of a, and a general idea like why shouldn't we create a robot that looks like human. And at the same time, he has made this research where basically he was evaluating the familiarity of technology, like how people treat it, what is their emotional reaction to certain types of um, uh, like what looks like human or what looks like uh, some living being. And what he has discovered is what he called uncanny valley. Basically, when there is a robot, there is an anthropomorphic robot where you use like synthetic skin and all this, uh, when it becomes extremely close to look like exact humans, uh, actually the real human reaction would be disgusted. I mean, uh, the people react very negatively to this type of robot. So, I mean, it is okay when we see robot as, let's say, anthropomorphic machine, like, for instance, Atlas from Boston Dynamics. It is okay, it is fascinating, we have a very positive emotion to that. We kind of want to explore that. When we see machine that kind of looks like exact human, with synthetic skin, with synthetic eyes, and all of this, it becomes really scary. And this is one of the factors that kind of uh, uh, stopped the progress at a certain point, which hasn't been explored before. Uh, on one hand, we have the organ projection, or the, on the other hand, there is a limit to this organ projection that we can use, or at least stop at a certain point, because, I mean, we probably wouldn't be able to cooperate with this type of robots. So, at the same time, since the very inception of cybernetics, uh, there was a lot of you know, myths, and visions, imaginary stories, science fiction novels, where we have been thinking like what this human-like robots with consciousness would be like. Will they be our friends? Will they fall in love with us? Will they be our sworn enemies who want to enslave humanity? Will they be our helpers? We do not quite know. But the only thing we know for sure and what we can draw from various science fiction, especially the retro science fiction, which based a lot on this type of synthetic life, is that we can find the sensors only when we reach the point where we can make machine conscious. And it is on its own a very hard task that is kind of a, we are in, in, in this middle point where we create system that looks a lot like conscious, but still maybe a little bit not like this. So we need to understand when we actually can call a machine conscious. How we can say that this is a true artificial intelligence? How we can say that the machine is intelligent? Well, this brilliant mathematician called Alan Turing, so at the point he has developed the test. In fact, it was a very interesting game at the very beginning, which he called the imitation game. When he was a student at the university, he kind of invented this little uh, hypothetical experiment which you kind of run as a game. So, for example, you're at the bar and you want to entertain yourself. You have a man and a woman who can communicate with you through some sort of notes. Uh, you don't see them and you don't hear them talk. The idea of this game is simple. The observer communicates with them through some uh, written text and uh, the idea is that, for instance, let's say um, a man here uh, wants to say that he is actually female, or a female is um, uh, trying to basically make sure that she's a female and that the other one is the liar. So the communication plays that way and, and, and the, the male player will win if he makes uh, observer believe that he is actually female. So the observer asks various questions that probably only female can answer. And the answers would probably be female-like. And it is a tricky situation for observer on its own. So uh, it is considered that if uh, 
uh, per se in this example, male makes observer think that he's a female, then he kind of passes this imitation game. At a certain point, well, it was just a funny experiment and funny war game. Uh, Turing thought like when he was thinking of the ideas of computation and advanced technology making machines conscious, he thought like what would happen if it would be man versus machine? What if machine will try to convince observer that it's actually human? So it, it began to emerge as a Turing test, so-called Turing test, and the idea was that machine tries to make observer believe uh, machine is human while human is trying to make Observer think that he is a human and the other one is a liar. And uh, by Turing, it was supposed to that if um, a machine can make observer believe that this is a human in front of him, then well, this machine passes the Turing test and we can assume that this machine is consciousness. It is aware of itself, it can think like a human, it can make other human believe that it thinks and behaves like human. Well, <laughs> The passing of a Turing test has been somewhat of a problem for a long period of time. Like, how exactly do we design this test? Is this test only specific to the chatbots? Does that mean that only through imitation of speech can we can make believe? Because it is considered that the speech is like the most difficult process due to the certain point. And, well, because there is a catch. What do you think is the catch with the Turing test? Why does he use speech as example? What do you think is the catch with the test? It's a lot more intuitive. A lot more intuitive. Well, it's actually a good one. But you see, intuition is something that we have been believing for a long time as a privilege of humans. Yet I would say that right now, machines are a lot more intuitive than we human are. And while developing such algorithms as machine learning and deep learning, furthermore, they have been a lot more intuitive than us. So intuition is not the case here. Perhaps complication then? Complication. Well, complication on the other hand is have something to do with, you know, more of a statistical approach, like it, it bases on computation, which is uh, obviously surpasses human brain by a lot, but it wouldn't work in, you know, very complex and unpredictable situations. Well, I wouldn't bother you a lot with more questions, so I will tell you. Let's say there is rational thinking and irrational thinking, and the Turing test lies somewhere in between. It's trying to work out with a thin, fine line between rational and rational thinking. Well, the catch here is that humans actually tend to behave irrationally. They tend to, you know, create some chaotic things, create some uh, I don't know, unpredictable situations and talks, especially in the conversation. While the rational thinking is not the way people tend to behave. So, um, right here I have Joshua Bach, the VP uh, of Research in AI Foundation, and actually he's one of the person who believes that um, the Turing test is definitely not enough. Uh, well, basically, it only makes human think that it is an intelligent. While Joshua believes that um, to go beyond this and to look for the systems that are able to perform a Turing test on you will be the right way to go. So in this case, the machine will really be aware of itself. It will understand that it is a machine and it will understand that it can, can try to simulate the same test that we are trying to run on the machines. Well, now, there was a, a, a brilliant um, philosopher, American philosopher called John Sorrell, who have designed this very intricate hypothetical experiment that was kind of an opposite to what Turing uh, proposed in his works, as we know now as a Turing test. And the idea of the Chinese room is the following. So let's say there is the scientist, John Sorrell, who obviously doesn't speak Chinese. He doesn't work, he doesn't know any character in Chinese, he doesn't know any word, and he doesn't know how to talk in Chinese. And he sits in a completely isolated room with like, let's say, a little, and a place where he can receive and give some uh, notes, for example. And he have a pen and, and something else. We'll see about it a little bit later. So there is another person who doesn't see John Sorrell, uh, but this person knows that John Sorrell is in the room. This person speaks Chinese, and this person is led to believe that John Sorrell actually knows Chinese. He's sitting in a Chinese room, by the way. So this person can communicate with John by giving him various notes. So let's say um, our person gives him a note that says 
something like this. John doesn't know what it is. He just receives a no and see various uncomprehensible symbols to him. The idea is that he has a little cookbook with him and it is some sort of a guide. I mean, he doesn't know Chinese, but he has, you know, different uh, letters, different symbols and characters. And it says, like, if you see something like this, like the number of characters, then you can write on the sheet of paper something like this. So this is what John does. He finds the symbols that looks like the one he received and draws the symbols as best as he can and provides it to the other person. So the other person now receives the answer to this question and basically gives another one. So John Sorrell unfortunately doesn't know that the person is asking what is the favorite color of him and he doesn't aware of the fact that he's answering that it is blue and then the other one says that wow that's cool because this is also my favorite color. It appears to be that they are having conversation but John Sorrell is not aware of anything that is happening. He's just communicating with some sort of characters he is not aware of what he's doing. And this is kind of a, the fundamental problem with machines right now. Because we tend to talk a lot about artificial intelligence. I mean, you have been told hundreds of times that you have a lot of AI in your smartphones, in your very pockets, right? Is that really artificial intelligence? Or is it a very smart algorithm? A very smart statistical and mathematical model that is implied in your piece of silicon that is lying in your pocket right now. Can it really think? Can it really feel anything? Can it be aware of itself? We're not quite sure. Well, the Norbert Wiener is uh, the founder and the godfather of cybernetics. He actually said that the dominance of the machine presupposes a society at the last stages of increasing entropy. And Basically, what he was saying is that uh, where the probability is negligible and where the statistical difference on the individual are nil, then, um, well, basically, the machine dominance can happen. And fortunately, he says, we have not yet reached such a state. Well, he said it in his work dated 1950. At that point, he didn't know exactly how technology will evolve, because only years after, um, happened a wonderful thing. There was this guy called Gordon Moore. He was one of the co-founders in the Intel Corporation. And uh, while he was in 1975 or something like that, he was preparing one of his public speeches on the like, evolution of technology and how basically technology is, is evolving right now. Uh, he has noticed a very interesting trend. And the trend is that uh, the number of transistors on microchips doubles every two years. What does that exactly mean? That means that every two years, the same technology that we have becomes more affordable, it becomes just simply more of this technology, it becomes cheaper. Uh, and apparently he has calculated and extrapolated, and it was back in 1970s. By the day, I mean, you can see in the statistics, it's by 2020, and you can see that it actually doubles every two years. So his prediction, his calculations actually happen all the time. What does it tell us? It tells us that Norbert Wiener was kind of thinking like we are not yet there, uh, was 20 years uh, like behind this situation with Gordon Moore, who actually have predicted the evolution of technology. And well, every year there is a little bit of information that probably the Gordon Rule law is about to kind of stop at a certain point. Like we're going to find the physical end of technology, the physical end of silicon. We probably need to kind of shift technology to something completely different, like non-silicon technology or whatever. We do not quite yet know how it's going to happen. But yet, every two years, it still emerges the same. That means that technology is growing rapidly, and the computational power also changes everything. And for instance, like the such algorithms are, which like are deep learning uh, are very common right now. At the same time, when I was a student, I was taught not to create neural networks that looks like deep learning because it was like completely stupid. Because if you do so, you will really not take into consideration the computational power, and these networks would not work. Nowadays, the computational power not only enables you to use such things as deep learning, but rather gives you a lot more opportunities with this. So, speaking of rapid growth of technology, 
uh, we might reach a certain point that is used to be known as technological singularity. One of the um, acolytes of this philosophy is Bernard Vinge, and in 1993 he actually described the technological singularity as the hypothetical point in time in which uh, technological growth becomes uncontrollable and irreversible. One of the features of this phenomenon is that um, we can kind of uh, simulate it in our heads what will happen if the technology keeps growing faster than we keep track of it, and that we can understand it. And, you know, we kind of can see it right now, not necessarily on a grander scale of things, like for instance, I mean, we know that our smartphones are using AI to enhance our photos, but do you know how uh, say convolutional uh, neural networks work probably not much or at least not not all of you know that and uh, More and more the new kind of technologies become more sophisticated more and more mathematical And we kind of use the same technology to enhance it and go on with it and to be honest Kind of I'm standing in front of you and talking about like the possible threats of AI and the possible uh, I don't know situations where it can get us well while preparing for this particular lecture, I have been using an application that has uh, the very uh, algorithms within it that kind of helped me to analyze bigger data and a lot of various uh, articles in like seconds. And I have kind of enhanced my own brain using AI. So does that mean that at a certain point, and obviously we use AI to kind of help us make decisions, to help us find more and better solutions that we can't calculate either quickly or deeply enough. And while using it, we can say, okay, AI told me that this is the way to go. AI can help me, it enhance my brain. But at what point AI will be that conscious, aware, and super intelligent that I will consider myself an ape versus this super technology? And at, at certain point, it will continue evolving due to Gordon Moore's law. But we would not, and so it will go a lot beyond our understanding. And this is actually those unforeseeable changes to human civilization that Vinge is talking about. This is what we call a technological singularity. Well, the singularity has other uh, possible situations going on with it. And the first of them is the reason why I want to get back to Laplace in 1814 is the philosophical essay of probability, and he kind of imagined the thing that we now call the Laplace's demon, although Laplace has never called it that way, but still, we are now known as the Laplace's demon. And generally, the Laplace's demon is some sort of a being, a creature, or probably a machine, or maybe an AI. We can now kind of transfer it there. Uh, that is so super intelligent that with uh, uh, this intellect, we're uh, all vast enough to submit the, this data to analysis, like all of the possible data of the world. And I mean, while we talk about big data analytics, it's kind of become more and more you know, feasible than what we have right now. Uh, so the idea of Laplace was that this creature will be able to embrace a single formula for all like the moves, uh, movements and, and greatest bodies and so on. So basically for such an intelligent creature, nothing would be uncertain. And basically at, at one point, this creature would know everything that happened in the past and will be able to extrapolate everything that will happen in the future. So for instance, if it understands all the fundamental laws and knows all the particles and basically can process all the possible data in the world, it can extrapolate to both sides. And it not can only say everything that happened in the life before, but it also will predict everything that will be able to happen in future. Uh, well, um, Laplace actually used it as kind of a philosophical, uh, hypothetical experiment uh, to describe probabilities and deterministic mechanics. Uh, we can see how Laplace's demon can actually be recreated as a digital creature, as probably the super intelligence, because we already know that machines have a lot better capabilities of computational power than humans. Uh, we kind of are safe at this point because uh, the computational tasks are very kind of simple, or they are trivial, or the results are probably known. Although these machines can calculate it better than us, we are still better than machines in a couple of different situations and different scenarios, which have kind of you know less um, variations and are less deterministic. But at the same time, there is a lot of discussion like, when we hit this point, 
when we can make machine truly conscious, and I mean, a lot of scientists over the world are working on this particular process right now. Uh, and by the way, they achieve a lot, which we'll talk in a different lectures. Um, like at a certain point, it will become possible that they will create these conscious machines that will rapidly, to the technological singularity, run to the point where it will be able to calculate that much that we couldn't comprehend. It. But this creature, this super intelligent, will be able to calculate everything for us and our behavior and how we fit into grander scale things. On one hand, this is a theoretical experiment. And this is kind of a possible hypothesis that might happen or might not. Probably we are not yet at that point. Well, probably we're not on that track yet. But um, I want to give another example. Who of you have seen Westworld, particularly third season here in the room? Oh man, there's got to be spoilers. Uh, well, since it's lecture, I wouldn't care that much. <laughs> Uh, then I will give you a little bit of kind of history. So there is this super intelligent machine called Rehoboam or the Solomon. Basically, there are two of them, but it wouldn't spoil the story. The idea is that this is like a, a an amplification of a super intelligent. This is a supercomputer who can calculate all the probabilities, all the possibilities at a certain point of time. And actually, this is a um, kind of great metaphor for the Laplace's demon. It's a supercomputer who can calculate everything in the universe and who can predict behaviors of people. Basically, um, in this uh, TV show, the people are using tons of technology just like we do ourselves right now. I mean, you can produce tons of data right now on yourself. You have your cell phones, you have your gadgets, you know, your variables, um, and like tons of information is produced right now by you, like hundreds of thousands, terabytes of information being produced all over the world every millisecond. And, I mean, by this, we kind of can probably recreate who you are. I mean, you know it to a certain extent with the big data analytics, right? You know that when you visit certain websites, kind of the other ones can give you the advertisement that works better to you because, you know, this website knows a lot about you upon how you click everything and what you search on the internet and so on. So we use it a lot for marketing and we kind of know about it. Now think of it like we know a lot more about you. You are a social network. We know like at what point you wake up, where you go. I mean, you have your GPSs in your pockets, right? Uh, we know like what you like, what you dislike, at what point and what type of movies you watch, and so on. I mean, kind of if a certain person can get access to all of this information, he can recreate your digital model that will actually kind of be able to calculate your behavior. And if we know your behavior, and as well we know behavior of all of the other people, let's say, in this room, uh, then we can precisely calculate what each of you will be doing. Like, who is probably, I don't know, the crazy terrorist who's going to stand up and start shooting. Or maybe not. Uh, anything else can happen, and only the calculation of algorithm can be able to predict it. So the Rehoboam in this um, West world is this type of a process demon who can actually calculate everything and gives to its owner the possibility to kind of control the future because it can tell him like, what should you do in order to control everything because it knows like everybody, it knows how to control crowds, cities, countries, or the whole world. It possesses all the knowledge of the initial state of the universe. It can extrapolate precisely all the future evolution of the universe. At the same time, we have this Dolores. I mean, if you haven't seen this, I will probably not spoil to you. But the idea is that at certain point, Solomon couldn't read Dolores. And I believe this is a perfect metaphor for how it is similar to how classic mechanics was incapable of reliably understanding or even um, comprehending the quantum world. And this is what happens to Laplace's demon, because on one hand, we kind of can't imagine Laplace's demon being re-emerged and being born out of silicon technology that can be presented as a super intelligence. On the other hand, we have a lot of going on in the quantum world with the possibilities and the probabilities and just general uncertainty. And at that point, we can treat the Loris, who can't be read by Solomon, as this new quantum world that is simply couldn't be comprehended by the superintelligence. So, to a certain extent, there is a possibility that we can create machines that are capable of uh, extremely 
uh, miraculous things. On the other hand, there is a limit to this vast universe that it probably wouldn't reach, and yet we still can't control it, but rather it needs to get to the right hand and be used in a proper way. So I think that on this very um, specific note, I would like to have a quick stop and you know, kind of launch a discussion on what we have just heard. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, I would like you to ask them, and so we can engage into conversation upon what we have just seen, what we have been just talking about. Let me know if you have any questions. One thing we have with knowledge right now, and all the one, and the one we had pretty much all the time, is that there's a certain liminal stages to it, uh, where at a certain point we can observe uh, up to a certain stage, but in order to advance to the next one, like with classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, sure. we have uh, no particular tools or ability to. It's not something we can base solely on uh, knowledge or logic, because there are some components we have not even taken into account. And uh, in order for a supercomputer to actually know the initial state of the universe and universe at large, it needs to have not only the computational device, but also the technology, tools, and actual ability for research that is still not in its possession. If it's just a supercomputer, it can analyze, but it cannot make these things. So they're still pretty dependent on being achieved. So my question is, I guess, if there was a supercomputer, there would still be a reason for human development, or at least human contribution to it. So how do we... Uh, properly make an idea of a supercomputer in, in, in case we need to. I want, I'm sorry, I went on such a long speech, I forgot. To no, 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 well, I think I, I think I got your question, actually, thank you for the question. And, uh, well, generally, the idea of, um, well, well, you see, there is uh, a hypothetical experiment uh, that I would like to tell you about that was uh, carried out by one of my colleagues, uh, Nikos Zagarakis, the, the um, uh, he, he have a lot of research in AI, and what he has is a hypothetical experiment that's called the camera state experiment. So, for instance, let's say you are a camera. The camera that sits on the wall and just simply watches what you have around you. I mean, uh, uh, you probably wouldn't be, we wouldn't be able to call you intelligent if you are such a camera because you don't have any motivators in your life. Like, yeah, for instance, we human beings have various motivators. For instance, like you need to eat in order to survive. Camera doesn't need anything, it just have one particular sense. It can see, it have eyes basically. And it doesn't need anything else, it just observes. So there is no external or even internal motivation for it to kind of evolve or even think of itself. But what if we gradually start to give more senses? Like let's say we give some microphones to it so we can hear the reality, what if we give some other senses that make it aware of the presence outside, it still wouldn't be conscious per se uh, or cognitive because um, generally, yeah, you could sense the world around you, but you wouldn't have any purpose to this, right? And the idea is that when we start to give this camera more purpose, or let's say we're going to start a train, let's say I'm going to give points to this camera when it starts doing something particular. And we kind of have this type of points, human beings, which is called survival. I mean, we need to do various stuff that we have points for nature in order for doing right or doing wrong. We also have, you know, some motor function that helps us, uh, you know, kind of sense the world around us. And these motivators are really uh, understandable. For instance, we have pleasure when we are told that this is something that you should do more. We have pain when uh, kind of I don't know the, our brain is trying to say do less of this. And so, if we give more of this type of motivators, if we give more of kind of understanding and the reason to search, explore the world, this camera will start to do a lot more stuff. It will start to explore the world, and it will try to understand it. On the other hand, at a certain point, when we can have the enough motivators for it to kind of evolve from a simple camera that was just standing on the wall and observing without any particular purpose, uh, at a certain point we will uh, 
put it in front of the mirror so it will see itself and it will try to understand what is it. So the general idea of this experiment is like to what extent do you need to have various motivators and senses or let's say sensors in this particular situation that can give you the initial motivation to research the world. As far as I understand your question, you are asking like at what point should this super intelligent actually want to, uh, I don't know, be invested in some sort of a research of the whole universe, whether we tell it or not. And the idea is that um, in the case that I have provided in, uh, in the West world, for example, the idea was that the sensors of the super intelligence were we, the humans, because we kind of produce tons of information. We have tons of technology on us all the time that can uh, draw the audio data, the video data, and all of various types of information that we gather around us. And basically now think of it more um, like of a modern day technology, simple technology. It's pointing, it's simple. Like big data analytics. I mean, the more of, of data you collect, the better you can make predictions or understanding of something. Um, so here we kind of imagine the situation where uh, the super intelligent can get such massive amounts of data about various things in the universe and have such an extended um, measures to actually feel this reality and see how far can this go. So at this point it can understand a lot more than we do. Uh, but I guess that your initial doubt that I hear in your question is that whether the superintelligence is able to use that type of technology since we do not have and who will probably invent it for the superintelligence. So I guess the answer to your um, question would be that uh, we are the anchor of this technology un un until we... Th that's why in this lecture I used the term the point where we reach the conscious AI. So. There is probably some sort of a technological point where we find the tools enough for the artificial intelligence or super intelligence to be able to explore it furthermore. For instance, right now we have algorithms that are capable of creating other AI algorithms. And this is something very interesting on its own. Now let's think that uh, with the right tools these algorithms would be able to create other types of technology that are probably capable of exploring the world in such a ways that we have never been thinking about. And, um, I mean, it was really hard to predict if it is possible uh, for us to reach this point. Uh, or maybe it's completely theoretical, hypothetical, I don't know. But the only thing that we have is kind of the rapidly ongoing trend of evolution of technology and kind of the things that we have right now and the things that we are uh, having for granted right now are the things that we probably couldn't even imagine like let's say 10 years ago. Moreover, like 20 years ago we wouldn't be able to think about like I know uh, that every person in this very room would sit with a smartphone capable of making calculations that previously were created, I don't know, like NASA servers with the computer of, of this room size uh, that was performing these calculations for like days. You know, you just simply press a button and this calculation happens. So I guess this is the general idea behind this concern. Uh, like, if we have this type of growth, it is really hard to, you know, look into the future and say what will happen because things change really rapidly. And the adoption of technology is also happening faster than ever. For instance, if you think of, uh, I know, the invention of a phone, uh, until the inception of a phone by Alexander Graham Bell, up to the um, uh, point where like every household in the US had this phone, it took like, I don't know, probably like 50 years or something. But at the same time, when we have a cell phone, it took like, I don't know, probably like 10 or maybe a little bit more. Uh, then when, I don't know, tablets were discovered, and so on, I mean, we can talk about, you know, just day-to-day -to -day technology that you use, for instance, like a smartwatch, when it was uh, invented and presented to the market, it took really small time when, like, a lot of people started using the general population. And the thing is that here is a very constant ongoing trend that is um, 
kind of changing and reshaping the world exponentially. Uh, so right now we can only try to predict and discuss these topics, see where it might go. And speaking of uh, artificial intelligence and machine intelligence specifically, uh, I think the only thing that stops us right now, especially when we think about organ projection, is that how little we actually know about the human consciousness right now. and that. The probably the biggest uh, discoveries that will happen to artificial intelligence lies actually in biochemical reactions in our very brain. Because what we're trying to do, we're trying to simulate um, AI technology with our own understanding of how we operate. You probably heard this term, artificial neural networks. And basically they are designed the way our neurons are designed. And we kind of draw this from the nature, from how nature created us. So we are the nature in this uh, artificial creation process. Um, so I, I hope that I at least gave a little bit perspective from your question, not necessarily the answer. Uh, yeah, Alexey, thank you. Uh, I, I'm struggling to kind of make a coherent picture of your lecture. And in particular, I'm going to press you to connect uh, two ideas, one John Searle's Chinese room, and secondly, the claim about the uh, Singularity, mm -hmm. that just by you know adding more and more transistors, you somehow get to the point when the machine is smarter than humans, or even infinitely smarter. Uh, so if you take Chinese room experiment seriously, so what happens is that John Searle sits in there, gets more and more instructions, more and more algorithms, quicker and quicker. It doesn't bring him any closer to understanding Chinese. So how come that accelerating the speed of calculations somehow will bring uh, computers closer to having anything like consciousness? It just gives more and more instructions to John Searle, who just operates faster, gives more and more kind of, you know, long answers. But he, right now, doesn't know Chinese just the way he did know when the technology was one million times slower. So how do you mean, which of these theories is correct? Because it cannot be two at the same time. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, so, uh, I think the answer would be a little bit tricky because probably uh, we, we need to explore more of the existing algorithms, but the general idea is that it's not about only the computational power that is uh, growing, but rather that the extensively growing computational power opens up the other possibilities of operation. So the general idea is that John Searle's experiment was uh, in a way, the criticism of Alan Turing test, which at the same time was in a, let's say, Alan Turing at his time, he was saying that in order to crack Turing's test, we need to have a machine that will have, um, I would probably misquote the exact data, but something like 100 megabytes of operative uh, like memory and, uh, I don't know, you, like, like s something like that. So basically, this is the point which we have surpassed long time ago in terms of computational power. But the idea was that this is not how we kind of crack the, uh, the Turing test. Because the Turing test on its own is uh, proved itself like to be a very kind of a wrong theory. On one hand, it implied that the speech is the trickiest part of what human can produce. So we will look at the speech because it's hard to mimic. On the other hand, uh, right now, I mean, you have in your pockets technology that kind of imitates voice assistants very clearly, and we have voice assistants that are making pranks on the other voice assistants or making calls to real life services, and you wouldn't even know that a robot called you. So, uh, on the other hand, this doesn't make it conscious. So, basically, John Searle's experiment was not about the um, kind of a, whether we are there yet, but rather about that. Turing's test is not how we should measure the consciousness. Uh, he, he was trying to say that the way we will measure it is the false way. And actually right now we already have algorithms like uh, deep learning technology that can surpass both Turing test and Chinese room test. Uh, at the same time, there is still a lot of doubt that we can't call it consciousness. Because in order to be consciousness and I mean, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't want to kind of rush myself because I want to talk about it in further lectures in more kind of deeper detail. But the general idea is that in order to become aware, 
Yeah. What are these features that you need to possess? What is it that makes us human? And what is it that machine makes machine-like? Um, so it is a tricky question to our own consciousness. Like what is it? The ability to feel, the ability to love, and what is it that makes us genuine? Uh, it's a tricky question. And um, uh, we need to kind of explore the motivators, what motivates us to do stuff like from the very basic, like from pain and pleasure to the very sophisticated acts of human. Uh, and since right now the AI technology and various uh, methods and algorithms are on the track of copying what happens in human's mind, basically if we talk about machine learning, we can say that this is somewhat of a just better version of statistics, then deep learning is something that is trying to mimic how a person's mind works. But once again, as I said before, it lies to the point like how far do we actually understand how the human brain works. And since we cracked this puzzle, I think the technology is already there. It's ready to accept this new ideas, algorithms, approaches, methods, whatever you call it, doesn't quite matter. Because for instance, when the idea came to mimic the way we think, the technology was already there and ready to kind of accept this type of new algorithms. And, um, I mean, it's just up to us right now to reimagine this new approach is that this uh, very fast uh, produce productive silicon can uh, apply and try to kind of make it just simply faster and better than we humans do. Well, I think this is the answer to your question. At least I hope that in some way I answered it. Yeah, any other questions? I couldn't be misleading to talk, to talk about artificial intelligence in this anthropocentric uh, concepts, like for example about mental functions or about motivations, because mm -hmm. maybe ascribing to AI human motivations produces a sphere, or could it prevent us from understanding how this all works? Uh, did I understand you correctly? Are you saying that should we even look into how we work in order to make machines better or maybe we should look into the different directions to make them surpass ourselves and how we think? Or did I misunderstood your question? Yeah, from the one hand, yes. Because uh -huh. even uh, neuroscientists, are, some neuroscientists are arguing that in order to understand the brain we need another concept, like other concepts. Yeah. But, and from the one, uh, from the other hand, um, could this concept that you use for AI be a cause of you know, fears connected with it hmm, and not the very technology itself? That's actually an interesting one. I haven't been thinking from this perspective actually. But um, actually in your question there is a, a very reasonable thought because this is what happens to robotics directly, not necessarily to AI, because AI is more sophisticated and tricky at that point, but let's look at this from an easier standpoint. Uh, that would happen to robotics. So at the very inception from cybernetics, like when people were imagining uh, the robots and technology was evolving in order to make it more autonomous, more capable, more precise, and so on, uh, people have been thinking of robots with a very anthropocentric philosophy, as just you said, like uh, what we see in like retro science fiction, right? But then at a certain point, this anthropocentric um, uh, vision has become less and less valuable because uh, the roboticists all over the world were trying to kind of think of robots as like, what are actually our human limits and how should we design robots in such a way that they will actually be better to certain tasks. For instance, let's imagine that you are creating a robot that is designed to extinguish fires. I mean, we can imagine the robot that looks like a fireman. He's like a human, he has two legs and two arms. Yeah, maybe he's very capable and agile, but still, like, what will he do? He will need to put a ladder to get to a certain floor, to get inside a window, and then you know, have a fire extinguisher to extinguish the fire. On the other hand, it will be a lot much better if we have a flying robot or if we have like a small robot that can roll inside the room in like places where a human wouldn't be able to get or anything else. But at the same time, uh, kind of, it seems like we are drawing away from anthropocentric centric uh, kind of philosophy. But on the other hand, we still locked in our organ projection uh, thinking and we designed these machines a lot like animals or other creatures that we are aware of. So I guess this is like the mystery of how 
humans creation work because and it, it kind of draws us back to how our recognition works because what is our own awareness and possibility to kind of creatively think rather than draw it from our own experience and from what we've learned and what we have known already and kind of mixing it and applying it to various situations. Therefore, the answer lies in how we create robots right now. We can't say that we are trying to think outside of the box, but at the same time there are limits and we kind of can find this organ projection philosophy on this as well. Like for instance, yeah, you can say that there is a drone, the, uh, uh, the, the flies, it's something like a bird, right? Or I don't know, like a fly. Um, so kind of we, will, we still keep looking at nature and how um, it have created, designed life. And we kind of, I know, just look at it a little bit and try to steal some cool ideas to implement to our own creations. I, I really doubt that there was like any type of creation that was like completely human-like, if we talk about technology specifically, like, I mean, something that we have designed that is uniquely to our own imagination. Somehow it is something that we draw from somewhere else. And um, that has definitely something to do with how we operate in our brains. And uh, while now cr recreating the way how machines think, we kind of still put the same algorithms. I mean, we are probably not aware to a certain extent, like we think we are the gods, and the creators who bring life to something completely lifeless, or wizards who create something out of nothing. But at the same time, we draw from our own experience, which is based on the sensors that we have and the reality that we percept, and kind of all of our free will and all of, all of our um, like consciousness actually draws from the situation that we're locked in, from the background that we cannot change, from the situation that we have been in that have influenced us. And basically all of this free will is somewhat of a static algorithm on its own. Yes, it's probably evolving, but at the same time the methods that we lie within our computational power, like artificial intelligence, is pretty much the same. Um, I think we'll probably talk about it more in the seminars. We have something to talk about it there as well. So, I'm not sure if there is a direct answer to your question because I am not aware of uh, the scenarios where uh, some developers or researchers has come to the ideas which would be like completely out of the box or not drawn from like nature or, or universal laws that are uh, that we are aware of. Um, so at the same time, I think it would be the right way to think about it. So we need to create something that is not like us in order to surpass us. Uh, so because right now we are simply measuring the computational power and definitely we know that, I don't know, computers can calculate simple mathematical equations a lot faster than we do. Uh, and this is just a simple example. Uh, but still, uh, I think this is how the situation rolls right now, and I don't know, maybe something will change at a certain point, but right now there is not much to say about it, except that it is what it is. It is now the notion of drawing from how we see the world and kind of trying to implement it digitally. I hope that I answered your question. If not, then let's continue. <laughs> Because I see that it probably misled in a different direction. Okay. Any other question? Yeah. Can you pass the microphone, please? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think uh, all, uh, everything that is done is uh, done along the lines of trying to imitate humans' uh, brain or humans' way of thinking. For example, if you look at the I don't know Facebook algorithm that just analyzes patterns. And uh, just uh, as far as I understand, maybe I'm wrong, right? But my understanding is that how it works is that it just, uh, for example, has a huge amount of data of how people who do something online also do some other things and it finds correlations. Mm -hmm. Because it has so much data, it can find correlations which are completely inexplainable for humans. Humans cannot make these connections because there is no theory that would be underlying it. For example, they discovered that people online who, I don't know, who uh, often like pictures of red cars, 
at the same time tend to live on high floors in the buildings, and therefore you should send them advertisement about, I don't know, parachutes or something like that, right? So uh, there is no connection. The computer doesn't try to understand why it might be the case. It doesn't have a psychological theory that, you know, liking of red color corresponds to liking of heights or fear of heights or anything like that. It just sees the connection and exploits it. It's very inhuman way of thinking, right? Because humans always need to understand why is it that somebody who does that also does this. And uh, humans have to do that because without theory, it, doesn't, it cannot operate so much data. Computers don't need theory because they have all the data already. So isn't that an example that artificial intelligence doesn't try to imitate the way humans think, but does something very different, and for that reason does it very well. And another thing about car driving, right? I mean, uh, uh, artificial driving cars. It's not trying to imitate the consciousness of a driver who would give them the algorithms, you know what, when you're learning how to drive, they, you know, you say, well, you know, if you see the car there, try it. No, it just does it in a very different way. And that's why artificial intelligence can be dangerous. It's not because it surpasses human and being like human, but it's because it can do something in a very different way and end up doing it much better. For example, have much better psychology predictions without any psychological theories. Well, yeah, thank you for this idea, but uh, I don't think that I can agree with it just on the go, because, uh, well, if we think careful about it, I mean, um, so you mentioned this Facebook algorithm that makes these correlations. I mean, uh, there is only one simple reason why humans can do these correlations, at least instantly, simply because our memory is a lot more limited than the memory of supercomputer, which have like t hundreds and thousands and millions of operations per second. Because basically, if you could have done this, I mean, have you ever struggled to, with the situations when kind of you s look at the person and you think that you know him from somewhere, but you can't quite remember? Now, think that you have an unlimited database and you can kind of remember all the faces that you have ever seen in your life on an instant. Think of your capabilities. I mean, Technically, you are capable of it. It is just the fact that human brain have its own limits. I mean, because we operate in a very uh, reactive way. I mean, the human brain re uh, operates in such a way that it kind of, uh, I'm not quite sure how it is called, but this is about um, kind of preserving energy. So we, we wouldn't use it because kind of we don't need it for survival per se right now. If your life would depend on it, you will probably think a lot harder than you do in your real life. Like for instance, I know that the one idea that came to my mind is this movie called uh, The Lessons of Far City when uh, the uh, person was captured by uh, Nazis and uh, uh, he said that he was a Persian in order for not to be killed. Uh, but he was not a Persian, so he had to invent a language. And one thing is to invent a language, uh, it's kind of like easy, you just mumble something. And the other one is try to memorize this word, because you will be teaching somebody the non-existent language. And the very fascinating thing that I find about this movie is that uh, when your life depends on it, your brain starts to operate in a different way, because you are in a situation where this is the exact precise thing you need to do. You need to memorize hundreds of words that are not existent and imagine them. Uh, therefore, there are possible capabilities of your brain. You just do not use them in general situations. So I think you, you are capable of finding this correlation. You just don't need to and this is how your brain operates. Now think of your brain on steroids and like, I know, like Sam mentioned a situation that you can open your third eye. You will probably be able to do this. Uh, or like the idea, you know, this neural network that has created this, uh, this, this called this person. Okay, this yeah. is not true. This is not true. Okay. It's not because I cannot remember all the faces, but because uh, like a Facebook algorithm, I, cannot ha I don't have time in my life <laughs> to really learn, you know, seven million cases of somebody like in the red car That's picture. True. So I cannot do it in principle, not because I'm too lazy or mm -hmm. not motivated enough. Well, I see. Uh, your um, idea basically draws from like how we behave normally, let's say. And I think that when we talk about AI drawing from uh, human version, is just like of the possible capabilities. Like, I mean, technically it is possible. It is not like something incomprehensible. If you create a very large table on the wall and draw the calculations, at a certain point you will find this correlation. It is not. 
you are not unable to do this. It's just that you can't do it on instant. And this is what computational power yeah, can. Well, it will take me more than the life of the universe to do. This. Probably, <laughs> probably more than your okay, life. So that's yeah. practically impossible. Theoretically, it's possible. Yeah, well, I, I, I see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Me, I don't know. Maybe this is you know our argument terminology. Like, uh, yeah. But but I see your point. I see your point. I actually haven't been thinking about it from that way. And uh, you know what? What's well, what always is curious. I mean, you mentioned that about the question of motivation. One 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 reason why we can say that well, why you know robots are not going to conquer the universe is because there is no reason. Why would they want it? Why humans want to conquer the universe? Because we have these instincts. Why we have these instincts? Because of our evolutionary history. Yeah. Populations which didn't have this history were extinct, right? Or so we ended up of kind of having this, or oh, we want to conquer another planet. What for? <laughs> there is no reason, right? So computers wouldn't have that evolutionary history, so probably they wouldn't have this innate kind of desire to, to, to do anything, by the way. Right? And the question I think that is very interesting is can we think of other non-biological mechanisms that do not create consciousness because nobody knows it, but create some kind of drive, a desire. Can a computer do want to do something? It's not programmed to want it, right? And develop this desire by itself uh, in the absence of, uh, of the genetic predisposition to desire certain things. And to and chemical gratitude that our brains receive because when they fulfill the desire, they just feel pleasure and they want to repeat it because it's pleasure. Yeah, that's true. And actually, uh, this is what you describe is that mythical point where we can reach the consciousness, like a true consciousness, like a super intelligence. Because this is the exact limit, the exact glass ceiling that we are looking at right now in this technology. Because what we have is, yeah, a lot of computational power, a lot of mathematics by this, and certain things can be done faster and better than humans. But on the other hand, there is no okay, let's say we have free will and there is no such a thing or like creativity because uh, all that it draws from is kind of the algorithms, instructions, it is pretty straightforward. So we haven't cracked this thing just yet. This is why the neural scientists are looking like, what is it that makes us tick? What is it that makes us you know, wake up with like crazy ideas, invent stuff? And why we can't make machines invent stuff? We haven't still done it because if you look at it, for instance, um, I don't know, we know that uh, artificial intelligence can draw uh, a painting, but it will draw a painting only analyzing tons of data of different artists, like their styles, exploring it, mixing it, and eventually you will see like, okay, so they basically created it out of something, they kind of created it out of nothing. And still we are talking that humans have this kind of uh, little secret points where we can create something that haven't been there before, even if it is the evolutionary thing, or maybe to have some connection to what you said before, because we can't see the correlation that obvious. I mean, for instance, we can uh, look at certain uh, artists who have created a super interesting new style with painting, but we probably wouldn't be able to analyze like what exactly, what, what type of neural connection happened in his brain, so what he have seen before, like, I don't know, what type of experience he had, that came up as a perfect equation to create this. So it didn't appear out of nothing. And there is a theoretical possibility to imitate it in machine, only if we can kind of, uh, I don't know, strip it down to very uh, exact instructions, then we will be able to repeat this process. Now, the general idea is that uh, the, the easiest version is, is let's say, uh, the artificial intelligence algorithms have been trained to play chess. And the very early first ones have been trained in a way that they have analyzed tons of different uh, games of different players, like to see all of the possible ways to play. Now the tricky part is what we should do to the algorithm in order to let him know just the, uh, the rules of the game and not let him play at all and then play to a person and actually be better at the game without ever playing it. The next step, can we make an algorithm uh, that would not even know the rules and maybe play with itself a couple of times and have the general notion and understanding of the game and then play it. Like for instance, uh, I don't know, you will learn by going. Uh, like say you are playing against somebody else and you try to figure out the rules, like how this person is playing, and then try to recreate it and then use it to your advantage, like the next step. And this is how actually the computer scientists are working on this algorithm. So basically you can say in a way that we are, um, I don't know, just chopping off this 
chunks of data that we have. Because the easiest thing is collect tons of data, find the correlation, produce the solution. Now, what should we do? So the, 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 secret of, uh, the secret ingredient of creating a true artificial intelligence is not teaching it to do anything, but rather imitate such a logic that will help it kind of understand the world on its own. And if we manage to do this, and if it's not just an illusion or the mimic at certain point when as a Turing test back in the day, and now we see it, it seems like this is intelligent, but once again, we're just not aware of what's inside the black box, uh, and just magician is not telling all of his secrets. But then, when, when, when we can truly be sure that there is no illusion in that, then I think this point can be surpassed. So, you're saying that in order to create an actual artificial intelligence that would mm, be intelligent, uh, with a point that it's supposed to have some sort of desire or drive, it's supposed to be at least in fundamental drive, full mimic of uh, human interest. But doesn't it make it faulty? Humans themselves have a lot of um, problems with their drives, their motivations, their interests, and there's a lot of philosophy that goes completely against it. The, nihilism, the abs absurdism, and existentialism tries to uh, justify, but still. So, if we have an, an artificial intelligence that we have no idea is if it's going to have any sort of interest in living, interest in doing anything, and the way to actually make it have this idea is by inducing it in mm, derogative understanding of the universe, such as ours, limited knowledge and so such, doesn't it make it, I don't know, like a fractured fairy tale of a concept of artificial intelligence and super intelligence in itself? Oh, well, I don't know, that's actually a very interesting idea. And uh, I think that, I mean, when you say about like nihilism and like general like absence of interest in a way, there is a very interesting example, at least that um, struck me back in the day when I heard of this example. It's a pretty old one, but still. Um, that things that we might think that we program can have an unexpected results. For instance, at a certain point, uh, some of the uh, software engineers were trying to create an AI for a video game. Basically, they were designing an AI for a Quake, and they wanted to, like, replace a player with artificial intelligence. Their general idea was like, uh, you need to survive, you need to be the best player. And kind of we know that Quake is a game about killing, we run and kill different monsters. So they kind of give the general understanding of how the game works, how you should run and kill everything, and then they give a very simple and clear instruction, like you need to survive, because this is, like, they kind of thought, what is, like, who is the best player? The best player is the one who stays alive the most, because he fights the most, he keeps surviving. So what did the artificial intelligence did? He refused to wage a war. He said that the best way of survival is not to engage in fight at all. And kind of this was completely not what the software engineers were expecting it to do, because they saw that it's going to be, I don't know, like, running faster, fighting more clever, but the best clever way to fight is not to fight. That's what AI have decided. So I think it has something to do with what you have said about like this nihilism and uh, kind of the absence of interest. Because on one hand, it had clear instructions: you need to fight better and so on. And on the other hand, it made a decision: it made a decision that the best way to survive is not to engage in fight. Um, now, can we think of it like now we need to give this artificial intelligence a rush? the, I don't know, interest to kill somebody else. Like, for some reason, we have this interest because we play these video games to, I don't know, draw some interest in it. And then we need to kind of imitate. We need to ask ourselves questions. Why do we play these games where, I mean, it's one thing to play games, it's another thing to wage real-life wars. It's another thing, like, why there is this violence in our nature. And do we actually need to imitate it in our artificial intelligence? Do we really need to think that hard about it in order to kind of mimic it and put it in AI? <laughs> yeah, uh, in terms of development, right? I mean, uh, I don't know, do, do people who work on artificial intelligence look at developmental psychology? Because it always sounds like, well, this brain, like human brain has consciousness, well, what about the computer? It doesn't have a consciousness, so what can we change? Human brain doesn't have any consciousness. <laughs> If you look at newborn child, does it have consciousness? No, it probably has consciousness by the age of five, right? Four, 
to well, kind of it's a it's a question to kind of learn to have consciousness. That's true. And uh, it means that in order to have consciousness, it's not enough to have a certain structure. You have to have a certain experience, and this experience is predicated on many biochemical or whatever interactions with the outside world, right? Uh, because otherwise, you can, if a if child just lives alone, right, on an island without talking to anybody, and just is, I mean, is, will this person have consciousness? Probably not. So the question is not how to create a computer which would have consciousness, but how to teach a computer to develop a consciousness. Is there any kind of research on this? Lines? Well, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, this is the general idea. It's not to simulate how uh, humans' brain work. It's to simulate, it, it is rather to simulate how human experience with this brain work. And this is exactly what you said, because right now we have a lot of neural networks who are reinforced, who are supervised, so basically one way is the supervised neural network where you kind of, I don't know, you show it, it is like teaching a child, I mean, you show it, like, is it a dog, it says yes, you say no, this is not a dog, you gotta show a cat, is it a dog, it says yes, no, is it not a dog, and then, to a certain extent, it starts to kind of understand what is a dog and what is not a dog. This is how it works. But the thing is that, like, how it actually happens. Do, do this machine actually understands what is a dog or it just can look at the dog and kind of think that this is what other people told me is a dog. But then think of how human brain works. Uh, at what point are you actually aware of what is a dog or you just have some visual imprints that tells you, hey, this is a dog, and I mean, this is what I've been taught. This is exactly what you said, um, like a theory that there is no such thing as self-development, because if you are like completely disconnected from the world, nothing is influencing you, then you have like no reason to develop, if it is a person. I mean, let's imagine that you are sitting on the top of the Everest, and nothing happens, like you are looking for some miraculous like, I don't know, insight, it wouldn't happen because nothing actually influences you. You need to communicate with people, you need to engage in various activities and so on in order to gain experience. And then your ability to reflect this experience is what makes you kind of who you are. Now, this is what uh, the uh, AI developers are trying to mimic. They are trying to create it. So what type of senses should it be? Where should it drag information? What type of data should we provide to it? What will be the general logic of it, rethinking and reimagining this information, uh, and so on. But I think that the general answer is that since, well, let's imagine that um, artificial intelligence or like neural network uh, needs to I don't know, look at, let's say, a dancer, uh, maybe as a popular dancer, how would she know that this is a popular dancer? And first of all, it will filter all the unnecessary information. I mean, it has kind of experience, it has like different information, so it filter like the lighting, it fill, filter the dress, the pose, and it will uh, just leave the features that are unique to this person, which are constant to this person. But this is not how human brain works, because we think in models. Uh, we kind of, this is, we will look at the movement, we will try to predict something, we'll draw it from experience. This is exactly, for instance, imagine like you're reading a book. Basically, when you're reading a book, you're hallucinating, your mind is hallucinating and creating out of your experience what you have in mind, something that is actually not there. You're just reading characters and your mind recreates some models of situations that is aware of or not aware of and thinking of them, which makes your experience and which makes you like dream it. Uh, Basically, it is, we are not yet there with artificial intelligence. I mean, we can't make it create these models and we can't make it hallucinate in a way. But uh, I think this is, this is one of the questions that scientists are trying to crack right now, how to make uh, it more model-oriented. And we'll uh, see in the later lectures how, how actually it makes from a mathematical standpoint and how it will work in order for, to, to enable us to make AI that can make this type of models. I think this is where the key lies, because uh, we are not mimicking the like, mind activity yet. We, we, we think in a completely different way, I think. Um, well, I think there is no questions, right? 
Thank you. Thank you for your questions, everybody. Uh, thank you for this time.